Hey, do you remember back in the day when we used to think if you hug somebody with HIV, you might contract a virus? We were living in some wild and crazy times. And there's this Bible verse that people quote a lot that says people perish for a lack of knowledge. And like one thing at Holy Smokes is we want to make sure people have the knowledge that they need. And when it comes to HIV, that is really true. Like people just don't have a lot of knowledge. So relationships perish, people perish perish, self-esteem perishes, and sometimes our memory perishes for a lack of knowledge because we don't know the history of stuff. So that is why we're having this conversation today, uh, how people really contract HIV so that we can all be in the know. Now, we got a really special guest for today. Her name is Minister Lisa Diane White. She's the Deputy Director of Sister Love, Inc. This is an organization that is committed to eradicating the impacts of HIV, specifically on women. And let me tell you right now, Minister Lisa did her thing on this episode. She was dropping dimes the whole time. Like, we really had a good time on this one. And I say we... Even though this is the first time in the history of Holy Smokes that I am not hosting an episode. Yes, I was in the live virtual audience for this one with the rest of the community because I was traveling and I couldn't actually be in place to host on this particular day. So guess who's hosting today? None other than my little sis, Tierney AT&T Ridley. We call her AT&T because she does all the things. She's my right arm. She's my admin. She's my co-producer. And she does an incredible job today hosting this conversation about how people really contract HIV. And in case you didn't know who I am, my name is Christian A. Smith. I'm the host and the heretic of Holy Smoke Cigars and Spirituality. I am the lead pastor and founder of the Faith Community, a virtual community of faith, uh, which is the home of Holy Smoke Cigars and Spirituality. And I am the author of Breaking All the Rules, an ancient framework for modern faith which serves as a resource for many of you um, who are deconstructing or decolonizing or decluttering your faith. You can get breaking all the rules right now. If you click the link in the show notes, uh, go to holysmokesmovement.com and there's a link there to order the book. You can get it in physical format e-copy and an audio book if you want to do that. Now, if you're listening to this episode and you rather watch it, we don't always publish visual episodes of the podcast to get that stuff. You got to join the digital community. You can actually be with us in like in real time when we record the podcast if you are part of our digital community. But for this HIV awareness and education series, we are publishing all of them as visual podcasts. Podcast. So if you would like to watch this, head over to our YouTube page. The link is in the show notes and you can watch this there. The reason that we're publishing these as visual episodes as well is because these episodes are sponsored by the Black Religious Roundtable from the Interdenominational Theological Center at Morehouse College, where we uh, got the funds to actually do these episodes. So shout out to the Black Religious Roundtable. Uh, for sponsoring this with the grant that we have. Speaking of the grant, three things I need you to do for me before you start this podcast. So number one, mark your calendars for May 18th. If you are in Atlanta or plan to be in Atlanta, May 18th, we would love to see you at Neighborhood Church in Atlanta at four o'clock. Um, we will be having an event to follow up on these episodes. We're going to have a talk back, a seminar, some activities and some on-site HIV testing. So Please mark your calendars for May 18th to join us for that. And then before you listen to this episode, I need you to take the pre-survey. It's a part of our grant requirement. Please take the pre-survey. And then when you get done listening, please take the post-survey. Both of them will take you 30 to 60 seconds tops. Not asking for a lot of time, just a little bit of intentionality. If you'll click the link in the show notes, take the pre-survey before you start. Take the post-survey after you get done. That's going to help us with reporting uh, for this work that we're doing to help put some education out there. So 
you know what to do. Let's get to it. I'm excited about this one because I'm just watching. This is the last you're going to see of me on this episode. This is the last you're going to hear of me on this episode. Unless somebody refers to the comments that I'm making in the chat because y'all know I ain't got no sense. And I just be saying whatever come to my mind. So you know what to do. Pull up a chair. Light a stick if you want. Pour a dram if you please. As we deconstruct harmful theology and build beloved community. One cigar at a time. Let's get to it. All right, we're back with another episode of <laughs> Oh Holy Smokes. I am Tierney AT&T subbing in for Bishop TikTok in his absence. As you can hear from us chuckling, we had mm-hmm. a good time in the pre-show, a good time was we had. Did. Um, we want to say a big welcome and hello to Minister Lisa Diane White for joining us yes. and being our special guest on this episode. Yes. Minister Lisa, would you like to say hello to the people? Good morning, good people. <laughs> good morning. Good that morning. was so cute. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> All right. So, you know what we do here. We are deconstructing harmful theology and building beloved community one cigar at a time. And we always have to get it started with our one rule. So I am going to kick it over to Rich Auntie to give us the one rule this morning. Hey, y'all, Rich Auntie reporting for duty, and it's my privilege to do the one rule today. So, you know, here at TFC, we believe in the one rule as our North Star, and it's that um, we have to honor each other's lived experiences and refuse to uplift theories over what people have actually lived. So healthy debates are welcome. We are an intellectual community. We love to talk things out but we're going to be kind while we do it. And that comes from several different faith traditions. But for those of you who are interested in the Bible, it is found in Matthew 22, 34, 40, which states your love for God is displayed through how you love your neighbor. And that's an extension of how you love yourself. Therefore, you cannot fully love God if you don't love your neighbor. And you definitely can't fully love your neighbor if you don't love yourself. So, you know. We walking in the greatest commandment over here. Lived experience and kindness are key. You can get into it or you can go somewhere else or be dragged in all the names while you're here. Learn you something in Jesus name and all the names. Amen. Amen. Learn you something. I Learn you something in all of the names. Amen. 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 All right. We want to get started with some introductions. And so. Oh, oh. <laughs> All right. And so the introduction questions today are what are you smoking and what are you drinking? But for smoking, we want to put a little spin on it. We want to put a little razzle dazzle. And so when we say smoking, think about something like sage, incense, Palo Santo, what you what you burning in the background. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes, yes. And so I'm gonna kick it over to Pamela um, to do the introduction first. Yes, I am a Pamela NFL, the one that lives down the street in Atlanta. Um, I am drinking water. I had some bubbly because I have been sucked into adulthood by rich auntie with these salsa waters. So that complaining that I was doing a few episodes ago, my life has been changed. I've been delivered and I've been brought to the light. So I do drink them every morning and all throughout the day. Um, I am burning seven chakras, um, little cones, not the sticks today um, because I got to go re-up. But I have some seven chakra cones that smell so good. And um, I really like these cones because they burn slow. And the scent, the fragrance lasts for a really long time. So that's what I'm on today. Yes, yeah. and the other introduction question is, what's one of the most ridiculous myths you've heard about HIV transmission? Um, <clears throat> I, I think when, it, when I was in elementary school, one of the things was you couldn't touch people. Like, it, it was like if you touched somebody or gave somebody a hug, you know, then you would be... Um, you would contract HIV or AIDS or whatever, and then you could pass it to other people just simply by hugging somebody. So that was definitely uh, a ridiculous myth that I heard. The touching and hugging was something we couldn't do because we would pass it. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. I had never, 
I had heard people talk about that, but I never actually experienced it based on, you know, the times in which I grew up. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Rich Auntie? I'm weak. She was just like, I'm young. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> right. Don't she have to remind us? <laughs> oh, my I'm like, well, I be so- getting on them when they call you the baby, but you just said you was the baby. So, anyway. Um, Rich Auntie, I am smoking... My very favorite incense, which is John the Conqueror. Mm. Um, as y'all know, I'm very interested in learning and growing in my hoodoo practice. And last night at BWAS, we had a time. My, my. So I'm still burning that incense. And the myth that I heard or learned was that if you got bit by a mosquito that bit somebody who had AIDS, you could get AIDS. I heard that too. So there was a time when, like, my friends were like, I don't like bugs as it is, but, <laughs> you know, people be lying, so you be super jumpy about something that's not even true. Mm-hmm. Wow. Bit by the mosquito that mm-hmm. bit somebody else. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Minister Lisa. Yes. Um, I am uh, burning, uh, I'm going to say this is old school, but a nag champa. <laughs> and I found a box and I was like, oh, I remember that. And I pulled it out and it's every memory that I have, you know, so I love it. Love it. And mm-hmm. I'm drinking water. And uh, one of the myths I heard, I was uh, doing an educational session and the man asked me, could he get it uh, from his uh, person that was cooking his food? And mm. I was like, how? You know, and he said, well, you know, can you get it from her cooking? I said, cutting up stuff? He said, no cooking. And I said, well, are y'all having sex on the stove? That That's probably the only way I think that might <laughs> work with you, having sex on the stove while you're cooking. So that one kind of threw me. And a second one was, uh, he said he could tell uh, by a woman's smell. And I was like, what does that smell? Is it... Uh, What's our favorite smell? You know, I'm like, <laughs> what is that? Oh, wow. The way they smell, whether or not they had uh, HIV. So, wow. That's that very really threw me. Uh, that's an interesting one. Yeah. yeah. I've that's definitely good. never heard that one before. Mm-hmm. Like, HIV has a smell now. I, I, you know, but specifically I on women. To help them out. And it was you like, were you saying, are they clean or what? You know, is it a particular perfume? You know, you got a little sense going on. Uh, either way. Somebody might be sniffing. Lord have mercy. <laughs> and only the women. It's only the women with the smell. Of course, only you know, the women. Because we do and give everything. <laughs> Lord have mercy. My mind. Wild. Wild out here. What All right. Bring? Yes. So, I, like I said, I'm Tierney AT&T. And so, I am drinking coffee and water. So, two cups, not quite three. So, I don't think... My auntie is in training today because if you got three cups at one time, you know, that's peak auntie. So I'm auntie in training today with the two cups. Um, And then what I'm burning is this sandalwood incense. It has become one of my favorites. I love the way that this smells. It's called Sandalwood Forest by Aromar. I got it from my local smoke shop. And so it's, it's going in the background. It's almost done. I might have to relit one relight it while we uh, while we doing this. And then one of the myths that I heard about HIV transmission was that you can't drink after people. So when you are, you know, out and about or when you're at, you know, the family functions or in any public gatherings, you can't drink out of the straw or out of the cup or, you know, out of the same pitcher or thing that the person who has HIV has drunk out of. So that's the one that was still lingering around during my time since y'all want to pick on me for being the baby since I had necessarily heard some of these other ones, but it was that you can't drink after people. And so um, I wanted us to talk about what some of these really ridiculous myths were, because the goal for this episode is to combat those and to talk about what HIV transmission and education actually is. How do you actually get HIV? How people really contract? HIV. And so some of these are very, very far-fetched, but let's bring it back to reality. Let's bring it back to the practicality of the things. And it's really, really important because most of us are in the South, but even in the United States as a whole, 
new HIV cases are still popping up each and every day. And so some people don't know how they contracted HIV. They thought what they were doing was the thing that they should be doing when they actually should be doing something else. And so there's this video that I encountered on Instagram. It was shared by, um, her name is Ashley Cobb. Her Instagram is Sex with Ashley. And it was talking about the new cases of HIV in the South. And so I'm going to play the video for us all here together. And then I just want to hear your reactions. Okay. HIV cases continue to soar across the Southeast, according to recent data from the CDC. Officials say Metro Atlanta had the third highest rate of new cases among U.S. metro areas in 2021. Fox 5's Joy Duke spoke with health officials about what they believe is driving the numbers. She joins us at the live desk with more. Joy? Yeah, Courtney Russ, Metro Atlanta saw more than 1,500 new cases of HIV reported in 2021. That's more than twice the national average. Health officials pointed to stigmas around the virus and access to care as ongoing issues contributing to those high numbers. The CDC's most recent data on new cases of HIV paints a startling picture of an ongoing health crisis in the Southeast. We've seen that HIV is growing in the South and Atlanta um, has some of the highest numbers in the South. Metro Atlanta ranked third behind Memphis and Miami in new HIV cases in 2021. The 20-county Atlanta metro area accounted for more than half of the 2,371 new diagnoses reported statewide. That that's a shocking number. Um, that especially when we think about the fact that we're talking about human lives. Jeff Cheek is the director of Fulton County's Department of HIV Elimination. He tells Fox 5 while national numbers have been trending downward, several factors have led to steady increases in HIV cases throughout the southeastern U.S. In the South, um, we do not have good health coverage for anyone, not only people living with HIV disease. And so that's why it's so important for us to look at Medicaid expansion to see what we can do to help people. Georgia was one of 10 states that opted out of Medicaid expansion. Dr. Cecil Bennett says access to care isn't the only issue in the South, where finding doctors who care for patients with the virus may be more difficult. We have to remember that, you know, we're, we're still in the South and there's a lot of stigma attached to uh, the LGBTQ community. While Cheek says the numbers are concerning, his office remains committed to connecting HIV positive patients with providers. and. And so we are in the South. We talked about the stigma that is still here. And Minister, Minister Lisa, I would love to hear your reactions or reflections to the information shared in the video. You know, I I listened to it earlier and, and even listening to it again, my, my first thoughts are about, you know, it's so easy to talk about the South, you know, and all of the things that we don't do in the South, you know, but I realized that, you know, the South is a, a part of the Bible Belt. And so when you talk about that Bible Belt, you know, you're really looking at a lot of homophobia. You're looking at a lot of, a, you know, quote unquote, you know, it is not OK to be who you are. You know, um, you know, we have this this place that you even talk about how we talk about religion in terms of what we decide that God thinks is an abomination. So all of these things, you know, contribute. Then you start talking about um, health care. Uh, to be diagnosed with HIV, typically to be treated by HIV, you need to be in health care. So if you don't have access to health care, you can't afford health care, you don't even do well care of any kind, then by the time you really find out what's going on with you, you may have, you know, you know, HIV, you may, it may contribute on further down to more HIV disease. And then to talk about HIV, people need to know that it can be treated, that you can live with it. It's a chronic disease. We're still treating it like uh, criminalization. Uh, we have a lot of laws on the book about HIV transmission. Uh, say if you use a sex toy, you don't disclose your status. If you don't disclose your status, period, then, you know, this is a criminal. This is a felony. So a lot of these things, you know, why would you even want to know your status? Because at least if you don't know, this is one of those things. I didn't even know I had it. But a lot of time people talk about having it and we think that people spread it knowingly. And a lot of people just simply don't know. You don't know how you get it. You don't know how you transmit it. You don't know what the myths are versus the facts. And so all of these things contribute to stigma, such as you can get it from a mosquito, you can get it from hugging, you can get it from eating, you can get it from touching. So if you don't know how it's transmitted, then you're going to spread those myths. If I never tell you, then you will come up with what you've heard and you will share that information with your friends and family. So if I think 
eating utensils at my home may cause you to give me HIV and I don't know your status, then everybody eating on paper plates. But see, now we all eating on paper plates and we all eating on, you know, you know, utensils. So you just need to know how it's spread. And if we're not talking about how it's transmitted and we're talking about it in ways of you gave it to me as opposed to I know how to protect myself from the acquisition of HIV or the transmission, because if I have it, I can transmit it uh, or not. If I'm taking medication, people don't even know if you take your medication properly, you cannot transmit HIV. These are new things. People don't know there's a pill you can take to prevent HIV. People don't know there's a shot you can take to prevent HIV. So it's all kind of, uh, you know, things that people just simply don't know. And it's also lack of income. If you couch surfing, if you are using sex as survival, you know, um, then you don't really have time to think about how to quote unquote protect yourself. You are trying to think of how to live and how to survive. Mm -hmm. So all these things kind of contribute to this stigma, these higher numbers and the lack of information. All of those things form a perfect storm of discrimination mm -hmm. and, and left outness, which usually looks like us. Mm hmm. Start talking about men who have sex with men, then we are really getting into it. If we start talking about who gave it to women, uh, it's because you didn't disclose your status. And if we're not walking around with homophobia, people can talk about all the ways they enjoy sex and they can talk about all the ways that they're spiritually and sexually fluid. And we mm. can have this conversation mm -hmm. and begin to talk about how might we quote unquote protect ourselves. And love Thank ourselves you. as opposed to acting like someone's a predator as opposed to some place where we didn't take care of our bodies. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you so much. That was, you said so many things. One of so many good things. One of the ones that stood out to me was thinking about the number of people who don't do well visits or don't go to the doctor anyways because of lack of access to health care and because of economic disadvantages, right? So thinking about how many systemic barriers are in place to you even being able to go to the doctor in the first place, let alone be diagnosed properly. And like, let's not even go down the rabbit hole of being misdiagnosed, but like mm -hmm. not even being able to go to the doctor in the first place because you are barely affording groceries or to be able to get yourself to work, let alone being able to pay to go to the doctor. Um, right. That's the part that really, really stood out to me based on what you said, Pam, Autumn. Yeah, what stood out to me is so interesting. I was, I listened to podcasts a lot and I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts. Um, I don't know if y'all listen to Jade and XD, um, but um, XD is, is a queer man. And he was talking about the, he mentioned how he knows black men who will only date outside of their race, mostly white men, because white men have more, will likely have access to healthcare and they feel like they cut their numbers down for contracting disease if they don't date black men. So like to, to hear him say that as a gay man and then hear this knowing the lack of access that we have just to bring those two two together is like wow because that's not something that I knew I didn't I didn't know that that was a thing so hearing him say that and then hearing you know knowing the lack of access to health care that we have it's just like wow people will even instead of being educated about it will use it to not even date within their race. That was just, that was beyond me. So yes, thank you for sharing that information and thank you for that video team. And, and if you her. look at white supremacy, you know, if we don't want to date ourselves because we think that uh, we are diseased, then why would they want to date us? Mm. So, you know, these places where we internalize some of these things, you know, we begin to discriminate uh, against our own selves as opposed to thinking about ways that we can advocate for more health care. You know, people have been advocating for Medicaid expansion and I don't even think people, a lot of people even know what that means, you know? So it's just like, do you have uh, the marketplace care, Obamacare? Do you even know that it's affordable or is it affordable when you don't have income? What we think is affordable for some is not affordable for others. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and the ways that the stigma leads to internalized racism as opposed to education. Right. Because mm-hmm. going to find education means you have to be seeking that you have to, like, be intentional in that. And yeah. the stigma turning into internalized racism is just, you know, a, a, a way of society, the way that things have always been and are continuing to be um, rich auntie. Yeah, I was going to say, um, Pam kind of said some of what came up for me, um, just in terms of the lack of access and how that's just what Minister Lisa said, a part of white supremacy and its structure and how it's designed to continually oppress us. But mm-hmm. the other thing that came up for me was the spiritual side, like because of spiritual bypassing and even like a stigma that people believe, like people really preached that AIDS was a, was a, a curse or a, like how leprosy or any of the plagues came. It's a consequence from God for being gay. So right. I think that even in our community, it's not just a lack of education. When you look at the spiritual implications of people who may be struggling with their beliefs about their identity, their beliefs about the innate goodness of their sexuality, when you've interpreted and internalized all of those messages of anti-Blackness and of homophobia, you can actually align yourself, even though it's even though it's contra everything that you are, you can align yourself with those values and then continue to put yourself at risk in terms of contracting HIV, right? Mm-hmm. Because people... People, you know, in church, we don't believe in abstinence education. So if you have sex, oops, you just have sex. When we could be talking to our teens and even our adults about safe sex practices, which would which would help us to be informed and to help us to have better health. And I know for myself, like as an educator, like my students come and ask me all kinds of questions. And when I was hyper-religious, I would just be like, nope, you need to pray, abstain, go talk to your mom, go talk to your counselor. But the children are seeking information. And I would, I would really be not a good person if I'm not giving them the correct answers in terms of protecting themselves because kids is, I mean, I've taught middle school, like kids as young as 11 are having Mm -hmm. conversations about sex and -hmm. they're having it with their peers based off of porn, the internet, and just a lot of miscommunicated sources that are wrong. So I think it's part of, part of our responsibility is not just, to be armed within our own knowledge, but to make sure we're educating young people because they are at risk as well. And and not just being at risk, they are young enough to contract it and have a lifetime of dealing mm. with the disease when we could have just taught them better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's, you know, when we in a, a lot of this is, which is why the projects that I'm working on are stem from spirituality, because when you can separate someone from the love of God, or you think that you can, when you think that someone cannot be your neighbor so you don't have to treat them as such, then this is how we begin to isolate people. We silence people and we make, we render them invisible. And I think it's, uh, uh, you know, I love the fact that you all are reminding us that we don't use any oppressive words when we are speaking about spirituality and how we talk about God because God is love and Mm -hmm. nothing can separate us from the love of God. But that's all you, most of us have been taught that these are the things that you do that will separate you from the love of God. And all of these are the places where stigma gets laid, spiritual and otherwise. We don't believe in spiritual fluidity. We certainly don't believe in sexual fluidity. And so if you have any conversations about anything other than what we think, and frankly, you don't need to have no conversations because one time I used the word vagina in a meeting and the woman stopped me and screamed and said, there are children in here. And I was like, do they not have a vagina? And and this is what? (laughs) <laughs> this what? First of all, first of all, I want to give Minister Lisa a mic drop for what please. And then I want to talk about how we don't use the correct terms to define mm. the body parts that we have, which is how we go down this long road of people. Mm situations that they don't understand or don't know how to define because you've been calling somebody's vagina a pocketbook ever since they were born and now they talk about somebody touched my pocketbook and you like your pocketbook did they steal your money no they're saying they're trying to tell you that someone touched them in an inappropriate way and y'all are getting lost in the syntax of communication because you didn't teach them that their vagina is a vagina correct 
Mm, 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 mm. And the shame that we have around the anatomically correct words baffles the hell out of me. Like, <laughs> what? It, it's a vagina. It's a penis. Like, you know, if you ooh, talk about it, you've done like some words. With it. <laughs> right? You didn't done some with it, so don't talk about it. You know, I don't know how many people look at children when they were exploring themselves as opposed to talking about the appropriate things about what you're seeing, what you want to touch, what mm -hmm. it is. If you answer the question, the curiosity goes away. They don't have to continue to do exploration. But why wouldn't you encourage people to explore their bodies and to know what they are? Because if you know what it is, you can protect it. When you can't mm -hmm. talk about it, you can't protect it. Mm -hmm. When you can't talk about it, you can't protect it. Okay, wait. Mic so we got to give you another mic drop. And we can talk about. And I need how... a tongues. I need some speaking oh, tongues. Oh, which one? Which one? The 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 sandwich in the drink. <laughs> a one <laughs> rule. Nope, that's not it. Lord. <laughs> Lord. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yes, it's dropping gems. Okay? Don't do it. Don't, don't do the tongues no more because I'm gonna be over here in the holiest of holies. <laughs> Autumn says she's sensitive today. Don't do I it. I am. Whenever I hear people speaking in tongues, when it felt like it got some unction behind it, I'm like, oh, check me out, God. Take my butt down. <laughs> And and what you said goes perfectly into where we're going next, because in church, the same thing happens in spirituality and in education. The same thing happens. If we can't talk about it, then we can't learn from it. What you can't talk about, you can't protect. And so when people are when people have learned the stigma, when you learn something at 20 and you don't you know, try to continue your education, that stays with you for the rest of your life. What you learned about HIV in the 1980s and the 1990s is not the same thing in 2024. And so when churches aren't, you know, continuing HIV education, when your social groups and your social clubs are scared to touch it and scared to talk about it, people get stuck in the knowledge of the past. And they think that that is something that is still applicable to today. And so, um, as a part of the Black Religious Roundtable, shout out to the Black Religious Roundtable. They um, are sponsoring this episode as a part of the Interfaith um, Interdenominational Theological Center and as a part of a grant that we at TFC applied for. So shout out to them. Um, but one of the things that we did as a part of our program was have Minister Lisa come in and do a session with us about HIV. And she did this activity um, that's called the High no low activity. And we talked about HIV transmission in a very practical way, not a very, you know, theoretical or it doesn't apply to me very, very far off in the sky that has nothing to do with my life. It was like, oh, some of these examples are examples of the ways that somebody in this room is actually having sex and thinking about what your risk level for HIV transmission is to bring this from a conversation that is very, very far in the sky and doesn't relate to you down to a conversation that is very practical and very applicable to your life. And so I would like to invite Minister Lisa to kind of give us an overview of the activity and kind of take us a little bit further. Okay. Well, the game, uh, we call it um, rate. We, we say rate the possibility of HIV transmission. And you can say the possibility is high. You can say the possibility is low. Or you can say it's non-existent. And the thing is, you get to decide because you're the one in the, the, in the room making the decisions. And so what we find is that the more information you have, the more the, the decisions that you can make. We don't want us to be in positions where you, uh, you know, you've already had sex. And then the next conversation is, what's your mama name? Who are your people? You know, now you're having conversations that are intimate and you've already shared the most intimate part of yourself. So, uh, you know, some of these things are designed simply to help you begin to think about things before you get into situations and also to kind of reduce stigma in terms of how HIV is transmitted and or acquired. Uh, would you like me to give some of the examples or is that later? Um, yeah, let's do the first one. OK, I can pick a couple. OK, um, so we are going to look at one. Um, so I'm going to talk about this. You're having condomless sex and you're having condomless anal sex. What is the possibility of HIV transmission? Is it high, low, or no? Rate the possibility of HIV transmission. So condomless anal sex. Condomless 
you don't have on a condom and you're having anal sex. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to go high. for high. High. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we're getting high. And so the reason it's high is because the first thing we said was condomless. Condoms are a barrier method that work. And also when you are having anal sex, uh, the possibility of transmission is high because you're se- you are sharing body fluids. And when you begin to share body fluids and you don't have protection, then that means the the possibility of transmission is high. So how about cuddling? Rate that possibility of HIV transmission. You all hugged up and loving and getting some of that good old cuddle. What's None. the possibility of HIV None. transmission? None. <laughs> <laughs> right. You see, now many of us going to go with, well, then cuddling leads to this, leads to this. It, it may, uh, but right now we're just cuddling. So that means the risk is not high. So that means the place where you can get it from hugging someone, touching someone, just simply being in their presence is, is not true. Give me all the cuddles. Yes. Mm-hmm. As many as you can, because that's what is lovely. Okay. So now we're talking about, uh, let's see. We're looking at this rated movie nice. with your partner. You're watching porn. No. What's the possibility of transmission? No. no. Mm-hmm. Now, see, no. Some, somebody already sent us to hell because we was watching porn. Somebody already decided that whatever you get because you're watching porn. You know, so all of these things, there's a judgment about it. But it does not transmit HIV. Now, if you're in the porn movie, and you don't use any uh, protection barrier method, the possibility of your transmission is different. But this is this is how we spread the myths because we just don't have enough information. So we mm-hmm. sitting in a hot tub naked with someone who has HIV. Uh, I'd low. say no. no. I'd say no. Okay. And someone said low. And see, these are the things that I'm asking you to, to look at. When we're talking about it, you're in a hot tub. And so there may be fluids in the water or whatever, but it's a hot tub. It's hot. Nah, but seriously, level with me. Why haven't you joined Patreon yet? Like, what are you waiting for? You have us in your ear almost every week, and you've been saying you're going to join Patreon for like seven months. If you don't stop playing and go to HolySmokesMovement.com and click join our digital community. Nah, but for real, the podcast really is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much stuff that we do in digital community together that you're missing out on, and it has nothing to do with where you live. Our community is spread out all over the world, and the only way this can survive is if those of you who benefit from it actually support it. So we're about to get back to the show, but here's my request. If you love us, support us. That's all I'm asking. Go to HolySmokesMovement.com right now and click join our digital community. You can do it right now while you continue listening to this episode. Don't wait unless you're driving. Don't do it while you're driving. But when you get to your destination, don't waste any time and join our digital community. They not going, you know, but folks is concerned. But it's just, there's no risk for the transmission of HIV. If you want to protect yourself, then you, you know, these are the places where stigma begins. If someone told you they had HIV and you'd be like, I'm not getting no trouble with you. Mm. you know, these are the places where people don't want to disclose because these are the things that we say. Right? You don't mm. even know, you know, uh, how what happens to HIV outside of the body. But since we don't know that, and there's so many different questions and answers, then people just be like, oh, no, I ain't doing none of that. So you, you know, there's mm, no. They just don't want to do nothing. They just don't want to do nothing. And so, you know, these are the things that we, people who live with the stigma, living with HIV, these are the things that make you not want to disclose. Minister Lisa, can we um pause here and talk about this one a little further? So one of the questions that came up in the chat is, won't the heat kill it? And can we talk about what it, what it would look like for like, um, if there's like bodily excrement or if there's open wounds or any of those types of things, some of the questions that people might have as they're thinking like, oh, well, I still, I don't quite understand. Right. So if you're in a hot tub with excrement, then uh, you already got some issues going on right there that doesn't have anything to do with HIV. You can transmit a whole lot of other types of, uh, you know, things uh, that come with excrement. <laughs> Um, the same way, you know, when you're talking about uh, maybe blood, uh, is blood, you know, blood can, HIV can live in blood. If you say maybe you're shooting 
uh, you're using drugs uh, with um, needles and you have blood in the syringe. You can live in the syringe for up to three to four weeks, depending on what site you Google. You know, it could live in uh, excrement, you know, if, uh, you know, there's some, you know, things of that nature. But you're also talking about this heat and you're also talking about a lot of, uh, you know, um, bleach and whatever those things are in a hot tub, you know. So this is why even when you're in a swimming pool and somebody poops in the pool at the, you know, at the, the water park, they shut it down. Lord, I'm Shut it down, y'all, because, you know, you, you can't have it. You know, they ask you not to come out there if you got diarrhea or dysentery and all those things that just keep on coming out. You know, so all of those things expose us to illness, not HIV, just HIV, but illness, period. You know, there's so many things you can get and you don't want any of those things. And so but what we're trying to do is have an understanding of uh, getting in a hot tub. You know, if you've got open wounds, you you say, if I asked you, uh, you share in toothbrushes. Is that a possibility for HIV transmission? No. No. Mm -hmm. Well, what if you got bleeding gums? Uh, low? It's blood. So there's, you know, HIV is transmitted through body fluids, blood. Uh, we're talking about um, vaginal fluids. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about fluids from out of uh, the penis, you know, pre-cum. It is not in... in it is in semen, but it's not in sperm. Mm. Right. Okay. So we're talking about body fluids that come, you know. And so all these things are part of body fit. So you can say low. If you got actively bleeding gums, why are you sharing toothbrushes? If it's pink right. in the sink, then uh, maybe you don't need to do that. You need to think, rethink, you know. If you it's pink in brushes, the sink, you need you to rethink. rethink. <laughs> I love these. I love them. I love them. Somebody type that in the chat. <laughs> if it's pink in the sink, you need to rethink. Come right. on, go. And again, we're talking about care, you know, because if you have pink in the sink, that means you're not able to see a dentist to get that plaque removed off them teeth. You know, and it, it, we think this is the norm, you know, and it is the norm when you don't have good quality health care and you can't do preventative uh, health care, whether it be oral or otherwise. And so these are the mm. places we look at what does a lack of health care contribute to a lot of things. If it's wet, it's a threat. Now, see, it's so much wet because sperm is wet, mm. but it's not a threat unless you're not looking to be pregnant. <laughs> if you're looking to be that pregnant, word. invitation, you know, <laughs> invitation, my, my, my. <laughs> Saliva is wet, but you got to exchange a whole lot of saliva. You know, we talking about gallons. If you kissing somebody that's that's dropping that much saliva on you, then get you a good towel and keep it moving. But you know, you talking about gallons of saliva for you to come up with enough HIV to transmit. Now, blood that's wet is a threat. Semen is a threat. Vaginal fluids is a threat. Fluids from the anus is a threat. Blood, needles, breast milk. Mm. If you like nurse me and you are living with HIV, if you're not on your medication and you are fully, you know, you know, virally suppressed, properly taking medication means that you can be virally suppressed. We're talking about studies where there have been over 3000 sex acts unprotected, no transmission. When there was transmission, someone stepped outside of the relationship and they were having a relationship with someone that was outside of the study. No transmission of HIV, virally suppressed. Now, I'm not talking about the way some of us take medication. I got a couple of antibiotics left. Would you like to have some? This will help. If you're not taking your antibiotics correctly, you don't need to have any to offer. So that means mm -hmm. you're not adherent. So if I tell you I took my medicine on Monday and I didn't take it on Tuesday and Wednesday and I took it on Thursday and Friday, that's not adherent. And these mm -hmm. are a whole lot of questions we need to have to talk to people about, you know, transmission. Again, lack of knowledge leads to stigma and discrimination. Mm -hmm. and, and medical care means someone is monitoring your HIV status and is properly treating you. You cannot transmit HIV. We have plenty of people who what we say are in serial discordant relationship. One has HIV, one does not. They have protected sex, unprotected sex. It's the choice they make in their relationship. You'd like to be able to make that choice when you are sexually uh, active. And the place is, we'd be like, somebody gave me HIV. 
Did you ask and did you protect yourself? Your body is yours to protect. We should not leave ourselves up for someone else's decision about what we know and what we so oui. questions. Like I said, don't have sex first and then be like, what's your mama name? Who are your people? What mm. you do? Turn on those lights. Let's look at a few things. Help us. Oh, ask the questions. My ask the goodness. questions. So, Minister Lisa, I have a couple questions. So, okay. ask um, the questions. Yes, yes, ask the questions. So, someone in the chat asked the difference between semen and sperm. And then, okay. as we go from there, can you talk to us a little bit about pink parts as we move on to, um, to do some of the other um, high, no, and low activities? Okay. Well, semen is the fluid, just the fluid that comes out. And sperm are the little fishies that move inside that. They're the ones that carry the possibility to be able to support you in terms of getting pregnant. So like, say if a person has come, pre-come, that may be just fluid. But then in terms of the, the sperm also lives inside that same fluid. So those are the things that comes out and you never know what's coming out. You can't say it was just a little pre-something or it wasn't no sperm or it wasn't no. So what ejaculates is a combination of both. And it mm -hmm. always is coming out at any point in time, as far as when you have a body that can ejaculate sperm and sperm fluids. You see the same fluids you have, you have fluids in your anus and you have fluids that come out of your body. You say you're wet. And so when you talk about pink parts, you're talking about those wet places, some places like in the vagina. It's some pink parts in there. You see pink. When you're talking about your throat and your mouth, there's some pink parts in there. When you talk about the anus, you open things up. If you take a look, some parts in there is black and some parts in there is pink. <laughs> you know, and so the further you go into the body, those parts are pink. And those are the parts that become, you know, um, uh, they're open to transmission. So if you're the skin and the anus is thin. So transmission occurs, which is why there is a the higher rates of uh, HIV transmission for people who are having anal sex and, and, and vigorous anal sex because of that thin skin. Uh, the vagina is an acidic place, so it does not like a lot of things. And so it kills a lot of stuff. But at the same time, it also allows things in and we need to be careful what we put in it. So it likes to be eaten, but it don't eat. So don't feed it. What? Listen, Run. listen. What? What? I cannot. I cannot. I need, I need a praise break. Wait okay. a minute. I need the lady to run. Where's the run in the <laughs> 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 This how we praise them down south. You are helping us in here, okay? Sheesh. <laughs> It likes to be eaten, but it does, it does not, not eat. eat. Right. Don't feed it. <laughs> Don't My feed it. God today. Okay. Listen, mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Okay, let's try one of these. You're licking honey off your partner's vagina without using any type of barrier, a plastic wrap, a dental dam. Now, we just had this conversation. Is that rate that possibility of transmission? High, low, or no? I'd say... Uh, low okay okay so you're eating honey licking with no, honey with no partner. barrier method you'd have no, no method. barrier method right okay low you're saying low and why are you all saying low tell me what you're thinking it's no uh, barrier method but it's well no because it's two pink parts if you're using the mouth in a oh no now i'm confused yeah, okay so maybe yeah. it's high because it's yeah. no barrier yeah. 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 Oh my oh my God. God. Right. you see you're not thinking all that when you see that honey no that's, no, why, that's why we got the right. right and i just told you it don't eat and you're sitting you sitting up right. to kind of feed it some honey somebody right. talking about yeast infection and all kind of thing it don't eat my but it likes to be eaten my so you licking, so just lick, just eat. But then you need to use a barrier method if you uh, know that you you don't know your partner's status. Now you can't get HIV if you don't have HIV. Right. How do you know? You only know if you take a blood test and you get properly diagnosed as whether or not you are living with HIV or not. And if you're not, then you choose to have unprotected sex. Then that's your choice. 
You choose to have unprotected sex with several partners and you know everybody's status. Now, you can't know my status just for the day because you don't know where I went to play after I told you what I did yesterday. We can go get tested together and come on out of there with our test results. You don't know where I go. But I'm not talking about our trust relationships. I'm talking about how do you take care of yourself, prevent transmission of HIV. Only you know what your status is and what's going on in your body. And then how you would choose to allow someone to enter into it. Mm. It's good. That's good. So good. That's real good. That's real good. Mm. Yeesh. Okay. All right. Let me give you another one. Let's see if you how you do with this one. Then. Um, so we're sharing needles to inject drugs, or we're drawing tattoos. What's the hi. possibility? Hi. 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 All right. So y'all know about tattoos and what happens when tattoos are being, you know. You got folks at home just tattooing up a stone. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, you know, if you, the needles are not clean and they, we talk about the fact that blood can live in needles, then mm -hmm. these things need to be, you know, done. You're talking about, you know, you can exchange needles for clean needles. But then, you know, folks is like, well, then we, we inviting people to use drugs. Mm -hmm. What we're inviting people to do is change your needles for clean needles so that you don't transmit HIV. We always get caught up in what else you're doing. But instead mm -hmm. of what we're trying to do. So these are the things, the political things, the moral things, all these things. You shouldn't use drugs. If you use drugs, then you get what you get. If you're gay, you get what you get. And see, this is all the places where we want to, like you said, decide that someone has been will need to be erased from the planet because of the choices that they make. Mm. That's yeah. so true. Yeah. That's where we get into the that that stigma conversation even, even more. Um, all right. And see, yeah. you don't know who has HIV. And that's what I'm going to ask you. Do you Can you tell what HIV looks like? Right. What does it look like? Does it have a smell? Does mm -hmm. it smell like patchouli? Yeah. <laughs> can you mm -hmm. get it cooking? See, you, these are the things we're talking about. Now, if I'm over here chopping up some stuff and I didn't cut myself and there's blood on the cutting board and I'm serving you food with that, then you, you should have some concerns, period. You know? But, you know, this, these are not the things that most people are doing. You know, this is why when you look at cooking shows and somebody cut themselves, they they getting rid of everything. They not tasting nothing if they don't know whether or not all of that blood has been cleansed up because they don't want to eat it. Now, we're not talking about what kind of steak you like. But these are the things that, you know, we need to understand what is uh, what increases the possibility of transmission of HIV. And, and if you have some of these conversations, you get to understand. So we are sharing eating utensils. This is that place we talked about. What is the possibility of HIV transmission? Uh, low. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd say, I only say that because, you know, that utensil is going in and out of a pink part, which is your <laughs> mouth. Okay, so but earlier you said you have to transmit like a gallon of a saliva. gallon. That's that's so, right. That's so right. no, I'm oh, trying yeah. to remember all of the parts. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> because see, we're talking about if there's just saliva, there's no risk. You can share if we're talking about there's blood in your mouth because of gum disease or any of those other things, mm -hmm. and that increases your risk because mm -hmm. that is a pink part, and that is a place that if you don't have good oral care. You know, then you don't have the ability to say that I don't know if I'm, you know, because they've seen places where, you know, in many places, you know how back in the day, uh, maybe today, your people used to chew your food and give it to the babies. Mm -hmm. and there's been some cases of transmission of HIV, you know, mm. and we're looking, you know, there's been transmission of HIV with breast milk. Uh, but then there's also been places where people who are living with HIV are breastfeeding their babies because they are virally suppressed. They're taking their medications. They're not looking to give their child HIV, but they also are looking to give their child the nourishment of their milk and what comes from the healthcare benefits of nursing babies. And so these are choices that people are making. And these are choices I guarantee you, if people know you're making as a black woman, somebody will come knocking on your door and arrest you. So be mm -hmm. mindful. Be mindful. They will come for you, you know, because some of these things, folks are like, you don't get to decide what's best for your baby. We do. Mm -hmm. I've seen people lose all of their children because they thought somebody was breastfeeding. You know, so wow. it just depends on who you are. And, you know, when your skin is brown, they come around more often than you like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this Very is true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that I I want people to think about. 
So now let's talk about this. You're having vaginal sex. I don't know if you all heard of this. It's called a polyurethane condom. But it's like uh, uh, the female, the, uh, they used to call it the female condom, but now they call it the, um, I forgot now, I forgot the name right now because I want it, but it's a polyurethane condom and some of them are made with nitrile, but you're having vaginal sex and you have on one of these condoms. And so what is the possibility of HIV transmission? Is it high? Is it low? Is it no? So there's a barrier method in place. Correct. So I'm going to go low. Okay. That's what I'm say. Okay. So would you say there was no risk? No possibility of transmission. I mean, I was thinking no risk, but I don't know the science of what the product is in terms of which like polyurethane. Like, you know, people always talk about latex and lambskin. I don't have sex with men, so I don't think about those things. But mm -hmm. I'm like, well, what does the material mean? Right. Well, see if you're talking about lambskin, lambskin is porous, so it allows the semen to pass through, to the sperm to pass through, the sperm. Oh, so, you, wow. you know, it's porous. So that means, you know, so you don't want something that's porous, you know, mm -hmm. if you, but if you're looking, you know, maybe you may want something to pass through and you don't mind. But if you're talking about polyurethane, it's heat sensitive. So it molds to the body. So you could put that, uh, you know, condom on. And it'll just, you can have it on for a couple hours and it's all nice and warm and you just come on in there and do your thing. You already ready. Now you might have a partner that when you take your clothes off, they might be like, oh, oh, what the hell is that? And uh -huh. then you have a conversation about it, you know, because sometimes people like to be the ones bringing the things to the party if they want anything. And so, you know, and then even if you don't want any of these things and you, you need to protect your toys, you know, you if you plan with some toys and you want to put some things, you need to put some things on it if you're sharing your toys. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sharing your toys is a possibility of HIV transmission. So, you know, it's again about your fluidity and your fluids. That's what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. You're teaching us today. And yeah, I'm is, so grateful. This is so <laughs> helpful. So the, um, risk, I didn't, the, the possibility of transmission Mission could be low to no. Like I said, you get to decide. So if you don't know enough, you don't know enough about uh, what they mean. If you don't know their status for maybe HIV, you don't know your own, then you don't know anything. So if you don't know, you might say the, the, the risk is a little higher. It might be low or you get to decide it's no. But when you think about it, you know. So now we're going to talk about mutual masturbation. What is the possibility of HIV transmission? Mutual. Not, no, you're gonna have to tell me what that is for you, right? I'm like, it's not well, a lot, so I'm trying to, you know, mutual could mean a lot of things. I'm doing me, you doing me. Oh, okay, doing no. you, is it, are we are we, we doing, doing our own other? thing in the same room? It's all we're not touching each other, you in your room, what right? You? She said, I'm doing me, you're doing you, so I would say, Are no. we doing we? It could well, be if we're doing if we, we doing we, 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 Right, yeah, but no mm. I'd we say low. Oh, okay. So you're saying if I'm doing me or you doing you or I'm touching you and you touching me, but we're not co-touching at all. We could be. That's mutual. Oh, we I'd say I'd say there's a possibility. Then and why is there a possibility? If there's no if there's no barrier and fluids are being transferred, especially if like we're touching each other, then mm -hmm. I'd say that there's a possibility. Um, because there's that. no barrier method. Yeah, on. and those are. Pink well, take your finger in me and my finger in you. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but what if we go back and whatever came out of you Ooh, is you going go in me? Now you're really talking. But if we're not right. going back and we just, you know, we're not doing nothing now. You see, somebody talking about zero. See? Yeah. We all going to get right with the Lord and we go going to scream, Lord Jesus, when we come. Ah! <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> yes, we <laughs> are. Yes, we are. <laughs> Come on in here. <laughs> and vitamins. Yes. 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 So see, these are the things that, you know, you got to think about. And ain't nobody thinking when they're feeling. They just mm -hmm. feel it. Mm -hmm. It's half the time your brain don't even work no more. You had to talk. Mm -hmm. That's a mic drop. When You, you right. ain't even thinking oh when you're feeling. <laughs> my goodness. So Ooh. I'm asking you to think now. You know, you know, we play these little games, you know, to... Keep people from playing the other kind of games we play. So, mm -hmm. so, so how about this one? We take our antibiotics before we have sex, 
And after we have unprotected sex, we take that antibiotic. But you don't take it any other time? We take it before and after. Hi. That's that's high. Because well, it won't it cancel out whatever other like so okay, I'm gonna go high. I'm gonna leave my thoughts to myself. What does an antibiotic have to do with sex and protection mm -hmm. and HIV? Let's start here. HIV is a virus. It is not able to be cured. There is no cure for HIV. There's no antibiotic you can take to cure HIV. So no. Now what you can take is a pill to prevent HIV. You can take a pill. So if you're taking a pill, but it's not, you have to take it before. But you can also take a pill after sex if you think that you have been exposed to HIV, and that's called PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis. And that's a 28-day uh, regimen if you think you've been exposed and you need to get to an emergency room or some type of medical care within 72 hours after you have been exposed. So if you think you've been exposed, you can go to the doctor and say, I think I've been exposed, and you take this course. And again, this is a medical uh, you know, conversation. And if we're not in a medical conversation, then you won't get that. There's also a pill you can take before you decide to have sex. So say if you are a person who is of, uh, you're male, then you need, you can take it up to seven days and then you can have sex, you know, and you are protected against HIV. Now it's not a hundred percent. So it's anywhere between 95% and a hundred percent. And depending on what you're taking, there's also but there's a pill, but women can't take that pill. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work for women. Uh, or, but there is a shot that everybody can get. And this shot is a long acting injectable. And you can ask your health care for that. And you can take that. And then you can get a shot. And then you can have sex. And unprotected sex if you choose to. But at any point in time, you know, I'm not ever going to say to you, you can have unprotected sex. But if that's something you and your partner talks about, you know they're their regimen around their adherence to their medication. You've spoken to your doctors and you can make that decision. So see, these are a lot of conversations that you need to have. You need to have good information. And these, some of these conversations are medical. And if you're not in any kind of medical situation of any kind, this is why we're not getting this information. We're not getting PrEP. We're not getting PEP. Folk don't know about it. They don't go to the doctors. They don't have money. They can't pay for it. They looking to see who's going to do this. You might be able to. There's plenty of support if you know where to go. But if you don't know where to go, you don't know who to ask, then you don't get those things. And you live at home not knowing any of these things. And if you don't have access to the information that we have, then you don't know how to share this to. So you realize there's a lot of tools out here to combat this virus. And this is what this conversation is about. It's also about us reducing stigma because if we talk about all these things, if I'm living with HIV and y'all all trying to figure out how not to get what I got, I don't even want to get out there. And then sometimes people are mad because somebody didn't think about them and they're like, look, somebody gave it to me, I'm going to give it to somebody else. And this is how we think about how we move in the world. But many of us are thoughtful and compassionate and we want to know. They won't test us sometimes for HIV at all. You go to the gynecologist. Sometimes you have to ask for the test that you want to mm -hmm. have. If mm -hmm. you able to go to the gynecologist and then you say, test me for HIV, you're not at risk. You a lesbian, but you don't know who I've been sexing and I don't know who my partner been sexing. Mm -hmm. So they might be a lesbian. I'm a lesbian, but then I don't know who you are. I know who you say you are when you're with me, but who are you when you're with them? Well, 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 my, that's a word right there. I know who I you say you are words. when you with me, but who are you when you with them? Right, and you get to be all those things if you invite that conversation and you open to it. I ain't looking for none of that. Then I'm not going to tell you about none of that. Mm. You don't and let me be, then you're going to be, you, you, you're going to get what you get. Yeah, and Minister Lisa, thank you for bringing that into the conversation because it, it's reminding me of um, this language that I heard on Instagram is HIV possible. And mm. so how, you know, sometimes when we think about stigma and we think about our risk factor for HIV, we have these very, um, you know, I have to be having this particular type of sex with this particular type of person order to be at risk for contracting HIV. And there's this new language and there's this new campaign about what it means to be HIV possible. Going back to what you were saying earlier about being sexually fluid 
about, you know, and spiritual fluid and all of the types of fluidity that are there. And so um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts around what it means, like what does that HIV possible language mean and how it applies to people who might not necessarily think they have a medium or high risk to contract it? HIV possible means you've decided what my possibility is as opposed to knowing what my status is directly. So that means you've decided. And that's that stigma, that's discrimination, that's isolation, and that's just straight up plain wrong. I know what is possible. You didn't just made a mistake because you don't know. Mm. So when you do know, there's no possibilities. And if you ask, and you go and you do something, you determine it together. Why are you talking about somebody's HIV possible? So that means you determining whether or not they too feminine, whether they too masculine, whether they too black, whether they got a swag, whether they got a switch, whether they got a, a, a smell, what you, what's the possibility? Mm -hmm. Something that you've decided. The possibility could be because you're just black. Mm -hmm. The possibility could be because you're poor. The possibility is I think you're gay. The possibility is I know you're gay. The possibility is I don't trust you. The possibility is somebody told me you did such and such and such, but I don't know, and they think you did, so I'm going to just say it was so. Possibilities ain't realities, and if we're living in the possibility, then i got something I can sell you, and it is not going to make you well, I guarantee you. So we mm -hmm. perish for the lack of knowledge and not in the context of indoctrination. That is right. I'm not indoctrinating you. I'm asking you to know and then to do better. Because when we know better, the hope is that we do better, but it's a possibility you may not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that my, possibility my, my. is real. Mm -hmm. Ooh, we. Oh, this is that you may This is so good. Um, Minister Lisa, let's do about two more and then we're gonna um, start getting ready to close up the episode. Okay. So let's see. We're gonna have anal sex. And before you put something in my anus, you will put a barrier on it. What is the possibility of HIV transmission? Low. Yeah, low. Okay. Let's talk about low. So why you say low? Because there's a barrier um, method in place. A barrier there's a barrier method. method. So that means there are fluids that are coming out of the, the anus and you are protected from the ones that are inserting, you know. Mm -hmm. So that means the possibility is low. Let's try one more. Um, we are shaving our legs, me and my woman. We shaving our legs and we're sharing the needles. I mean, sharing our razors. Mm -hmm. What's the possibility of us uh, transmitting HIV? If somebody gets cut, there's a possibility. Mm -hmm. If you're sharing that razor, if, if somebody gets cut and nobody knows their status, Right. It's a possibility. And we, we're talking about little microscopic cuts, you know. But mm -hmm. you see, this is why stigma is high, because we always looking at some way somebody can give us something. And this is the place where I'm asking you to look at how can you prevent the possibility of transmission? You're thinking about what might you do to prevent transmission of HIV as opposed to thinking about what can you do to keep somebody from giving you something. That's a whole different kind of way of talking about HIV that we don't talk about because we talk about all these things in ways that, oh, what did you give me now? What's the possibility you might do this? You know, and, it, and it's like if, if you're living with HIV, you don't want to be spoken about like that. And you don't want to talk about your status when you're listening to how we talk. So even as I play these games, I want to be very mindful is that I don't know who's in the room. I don't know what your status is. And I may love you and you may be loving someone. And these are people that you know and love and you want to be able to talk about HIV thoughtfully in a way that is not discriminatory. And so I'll give us one more. Um, I'm pregnant. So we can just have unprotected sex. Hi. Yes. Hi. Very high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. That's scary. Pregnancy may be a barrier method to another pregnancy, but it is not a barrier method for the, the transmission of any uh, HIV or sexually transmitted diseases of any kind. But you see how folk be, oh, you have to get you a pregnant woman. Mm -hmm. And the folk, it's like, oh, you, that's good sex. And mm -hmm. you can't get pregnant, you ain't got to worry about nothing. Yes, wow. you do. You got to worry about a lot of things. And uh, so. 
Yeah. Thank you so thank much you. for yeah, walking us through you. these different examples and activities and thinking about the practicalities of the ways that we are having sex. This has been very helpful. Even as someone who has done it before, doing it again <laughs> just makes you think about it in completely different ways. Um, so I want us to go around and share any thoughts, anything that came up for us as we were going through the activity. And then I want to offer the final word to Minister Lisa. Pam? I was just going to say that, um, and I think Tiffany might have mentioned it in the comments. I didn't know that there were so many um, options uh, to reduce the transmission and to also um, help people that are living with HIV. I didn't know about the shot. That's my first time hearing that. So, yeah, I, I really appreciate you coming through with all this education. It's been enlightening. Mm -hmm. It's really been enlightening. Yeah, the shot's been on the market, I would say, for at least a year as far as there's HIV treatment. You can get uh, what you call long acting injectables for the prevention, you know, for you have to treat HIV. And they're now long acting uh, injectables to protect against the transmission. And that's called the PrEP, pre exposure prophylaxis. And that is available for, like I said, all women and all men. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Regency? Well, while all the things were going on, two things came to my mind um, that I'll talk about to wrap up. But it was just the way that HIV is politicized and the way that bodies that have HIV are policed. Um, and so I think for me, it just gave me not just a greater awareness, but a greater conviction that um, people who have this virus, they deserve dignity. Um, they deserve inclusion. They deserve our love. Um, and we just, you know, it just takes me back to casting out fear. You know, that's what perfect love does. And so I just want to be more aware and diligent in the way that I interact with people, because I think that there's so much stigmatization that leads to shame and all of the, you know, horrible things that come when a person is under shame. So I'm glad that I have, I knew a lot of that stuff, but I'm glad that I learned some things today because I think that we need to just treat people better. Um, and the way that this virus is, I don't want to say like over, it's blown, overblown, but it's like, we focus on this. There's so many other things that people could have, but because of all of the subtext that comes with this disease, it's a different type of thing. So thank you so much, Minister Lisa. Yeah. And I don't want to overlook, you know, that report that we saw when we looked at the rates of HIV in, in Atlanta. Those are numbers that are cause for alarm. And so when we're looking at all of the things that keep us from being able to respond to that, you know, those are cries that we need to pay attention to and that it does need our attention and it does need extra attention, but not in terms of they're rising, their numbers are rising and they're going to come for us. You know, these are the places where people be like, oh, there's more I'm out there to have sex with, be careful, as opposed to how white might we advocate for better access and treatment for people, period, so that HIV can get covered as well. Yeah, and I and I thank you so much for sharing that. And I think it kind of speaks to the thing that came up for me. The, the subline that I have been focused on the whole conversation is communication. And from so many different angles, right? Communication with the people you're having sex with, communication with yourself, being honest about the activities you're engaging with, being honest with yourself, which therefore allows you to be honest with the people you're having sex with. Um, communication with your healthcare for healthcare providers to the, um, you know, if you are someone who is having sex, not going to the doctor and lying. And so talking mm -hmm. and being honest about what your actual risk factors are and being honest about you know, the things that you're doing so that you can get the best advice. Because if you go to the doctor and you lie and you'd be like, oh, no. And they ask you how many people you had sex with in the last amount of time. And you'd be like, oh, it's just one. You have had sex with 12 people. And it ain't nothing wrong with that. But don't lie, because the answer from that question and the answer that you ask that actually is the truth would probably require them to ask you different follow up questions. And so right. just thinking about communication in all of those ways, which kind of helps us to undo that stigma and undo some of those layers because if we're on if we feel comfortable enough to be honest about what we're talking about then some of this stigma and this lack of education will be um, undone just because we we told the truth but people also need to be, be comfortable enough to tell the truth and feel like they're in a safe enough space to tell the truth and Correct. so coming coming from it full circle i'm just thinking about communication from all of those different angles yeah. I'm really glad you added that piece about the full circle, because if I told you I had 
12 partners and you was like, you know, as best as you can, you like, and then try to fix your face. You're not ready to did mm-hmm. it. You know, mm-hmm. and then if you hear me outside talking to my coworker, girl, she a hoe. You know, mm-hmm. and or else she says she got 12 partners. You know, these are all the things that are communication in that circle. Your doctor, when you tell them, you know, when they say, girl, you're not at risk for HIV. I just asked you to test me. That's communication. Do as I mm-hmm. ask. You know, and then they said that they're doctors who don't know about HIV. I guarantee you, if any of you have been to the doctor, if your doctor has not talked to you about PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, it's because they don't know to do so. And that, you know, you hear on TV every day, talk to your doctor about. Now, I'm going to tell you mm-hmm. one thing. I like my doctor to know more than me. I just like that. It makes me feel a little bit more, you know, comfortable. I don't want to know more than you. And I already know more than you because I know my body. But I also don't want to know more about my body because I didn't Google it, as opposed to the fact that I came to the doctor because I want to trust you and your expertise. And so I want you to know as much and more. And I want you to be able to offer me options and to trust me. So all of that is part of that communication that is really vital. So when we're talking about who we should be having conversations with, is anybody that's having conversations with us. Full mm-hmm. circle. I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I want to um, offer you the final word. Is there anything that you still would like to share with us? Anything you think we didn't cover? Any final thoughts you would like to leave us with? You know, we play this other game and we call it the synonym game. And we want to know what you call your body parts. And so when you talked about the pocketbook, you know, I used to struggle because my mama be don't put your purse on the floor. I was like, does that mean don't sit on the floor or don't put my purse on the floor? I didn't know what it meant. Will I not have money or will something happen to me if I put my vagina down on the floor. So see, you you do need to know what we're talking about, but that mm-hmm. at the end of the day, when we all tell you what we call it, how we talk about it, then the goal is how do we protect it? So whatever you call it, talk about the protection that you need to have. And so I really, I like games, but also like the messages that we get from games. So I thank you for the invitations and all of the places mm-hmm. that you affirm me with mic drops and all those things. Yes. They, they make me feel so powerful. So thank you so much for all of your aff- your affirming ways. It was, yes, yes. And, we're, and we're you are powerful. powerful. Final, yes. <laughs> a final round of applause. In the second episode of our um, podcast series in collaboration with the Black Religious Roundtable, on the final episode, we are going to talk about PrEP and PEP and other um, other methods that you can use for HIV prevention. Um, like Pamela and Tiffany were saying, they didn't know that there were so many. And so we want to dig into what all of those are, how you can have access to them, um, how you can ask about where they are. And so um, Reverend Sean Torres Anderson, who was here with us for the first episode, will be back with us for that episode. And so we are super excited to have that conversation. Thank you so much again, Minister Lisa, for being here. And we hope that yes. as you have been listening to this, you've been able to take something away and apply it to the ways you talk about your health and the ways that you are thinking about who and how you're having sex. Um, and so we hope you'll join us back here next time as we're deconstructing harmful theology and building beloved community one cigar at a time. Uh-huh. Peace and blue magic hair grease. Uh-huh. Thank you, family. <laughs> All right. So the episode is over. Are there questions that we didn't answer that you were hoping we would discuss? Is there more conversation you'd like to have about this topic? If you made it this far into the episode, the only thing left for you to do is join the Patreon community because that's where all of that stuff happens. We continue these conversations every day. We have a whole ecosystem of digital communities, like 10 different communities that you can get access to for $10 a month total. And you can watch these recordings uh, on demand. And if you upgrade to a higher tier, you can actually be in the live virtual audience when we record these in real time. Get the pre-show, the after show, you get backstage passes. Go over to holysmokesmovement.com and then click join our digital community. And if you still got questions about how the digital community works, when you go to holysmokesmovement.com, there's a video right there. Watch that video, learn a little bit more, and then come over and holler at us in our digital community. Holysmokesmovement.com. Click join our digital community. We'll see you there.